Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 66. I don't know if you can hear them, but there are so many frogs outside my window right now. It's evening, 8pm as I record this, and there are frogs everywhere. It's making me smile. (laughs) Today's guest, Preeti Swami, is an artist from Queens, New York. With an appreciation for all things woodland and whimsical, she would love the frogs outside my window, Preeti started Garden Slug Productions as a place to document her creative journey. In our conversation, we speak about the uncertainty of recent times and how art, nature and community can help keep us grounded through all this upheaval and change. Preeti also tells the story of how she developed her love of magical woodland scenes in the nature outings of her childhood. Let's listen. Thank you so much for being here with me. I'm really looking forward to our chat today. Oh, me too. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. (laughs) So I always start, as you know, by going back and talking about nature in my guest's childhood. And I wonder if nature's been part of your life from the beginning. My connection to nature is actually quite interesting because it started off strong and then veered off. And now there's this return to nature in my adulthood. So to get to the beginning, I was born in the UK and I was born in the Midlands. I was born in Coventry and I lived in the UK for seven years. Um, So from birth to seven, my early childhood, which I really think are these formative years where your personality is really molded into who you will become later. There are certain stones that you follow and and you're walking in this path as a child and you kind of get set in your way, I think, at that time. You might say your personality forms. And for me, that exposure to nature as a childhood really has affected me throughout my life. And what that really was, was I lived in like England and I was always close to woodland areas. And I have this love of woodland area. And my father, as you know, he was also new to England and that he had moved to England from India. And he was experiencing this new sort of ecosystem of, Mm. you know, this new nature experience of going from very tropical heat to what is this beautiful, I love to use the word, damp and to me damp doesn't have a negative connotation to me it's like that's where there's life it's like after the rain there's these mushrooms sprouting you know there are worms going through the earth there are snails um there's just this beauty of dewdrops, and it's that nature we both connected with during these nature walks as a young child and not only was it just sort of a walk where you know father is taking his little daughter out it was really a bonding time for us so that natural connection, you know, is probably the most, I say, formative, formative piece of me realizing like this, this is the environment I like. And, and I say that because I don't like heat. I don't like beaches. I <laughs> like, I like that, you know, damp, wet forest. Muddy is like the best word to use right now. Like I have a child in memory. I wasn't scared of getting muddy. I didn't, I liked the mud on my boots. It was very satisfying to feel that squish like in like Wellington boots. So that's really um, my early nature exposure. And then from there, like after seven, the family moved to Canada and we moved essentially to a very suburban area. And so those woodland walks didn't happen, but my family did like parks and needed to be around nature so that what we could do we did do but it really wasn't a strong presence in my life i'd say when the time by the time i was in middle school or high school and then you know after living in canada you know i did do my university in montreal which is a big city and then i moved to new york city and so you were sort of veering off from like having that deep connection to nature 
At and that how point. did you return to it? So it's so interesting. I th- and one thing I will say, the thing about New York City is, you know, even though you're in the middle of a city, and I live in Queens, and you know, you walk outside and it's concrete, there is an incredible amount of green space. That's mm-hmm. the beauty of the city. There is truly this initiative to make sure there's green space for people to enjoy. So there's always little pockets of parks and spaces where you can sit, take a moment from your day, you know, sip on your coffee or just take a break, right? And there is a tree and there is some sort of grass. And, you know, you may have a pigeon or a squirrel and it may not be, you know, the most romantic of nature, but it's still <laughs> nature, right? And and then, then, of course, you have something more manicured, like you have the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens and the gardens up in the Bronx, as well as you also have Central Park, of course, which is stunningly beautiful. But there is so much nature around you. But for me, the return, I think, came from this interest in wanting to draw again. So it started with drawing. And I'm always drawn to natural subjects, organic subjects. So that's what I was drawing, whether it would be vegetables or little critters. And that that's how I sort of made my connection back because when you're drawing those things, you want to see those things in nature. And that's truly, I think, where there was this ignition again of mm-hmm. needing to be around nature. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the pandemic, and we can get into that, it's at that point, that's truly when things started to change for me. This need to be like, let's go upstate and go hiking and do those type of activities. So, Yes. There's two, there's two things I want to touch on there. Definitely sure. the pandemic. and But first, you, you said you wanted to draw again. And I'm wondering about oh. that. Did you have art with you all through the, your life? Is it something you returned to after you stepped away from it for a while what what was what's your relationship with art over the years so that's as a child it's what I love to do it was like nothing excited me more than like felt it pens and my dad would always come home from work with like copy paper and that would be very exciting for me and you know just to draw that was to me an escape and such relaxation um you know I could just get lost in it you know some children get lost in books, I would get lost with pens and paper. Yes. And, um, you know, I think as I got older, when I say older, like the middle school type years and high school years, I would just, there's a lot of things distracting me around. Yes. So there's a lot of distractions around me. And I wasn't as focused on drawing. You know, I always took art classes through high school and really enjoyed them. But for some reason or other, it wasn't something I focused on, but I loved doing it. And then in university, I actually took a life drawing class. It was like an elective. And it was so different from what I was doing. My undergraduate studies were in um, physiology. So I was a science major, um, which actually really connects well to the whole idea of nature. Yes, I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so I took these life drawing classes and I was just like, this is what I've been missing. Mm -hmm. And I need to do this as much as, you know, you can be a distracted teenager and, and you you sort of don't see the value of spending time drawing. I realized there was something very satisfying about it. um, And it gave me, I guess, a way of expressing myself um, that I couldn't otherwise do. And it was also a very inquisitive time, like very, you know, introspective while drawing and focusing. And so I really enjoyed that. And ultimately... After that drawing class in university, I sought it out more. I spent more time drawing. And I would say about eight years back, I just, that's probably the time when I was like, I need to draw. I need Mm -hmm. to draw more. And that's when I got really back into saying, well, I'm going to draw little vegetables or, you know, little critters. And I was learning again. I was like, I want to learn watercolor. I want to learn color pencils. And the great thing about being in New York City is there's always an art class and it can be so niche and so specific. (laughs) And it's been great. And one thing I did a lot of was like a lot of plein air drawing. So being out, there were lots of classes you could go through a botanical garden with a sketchbook and color pencils and draw. And I, that's, that's really when I say I fostered it again, but definitely Mm -hmm. art has always been something there. And this point in my life it just became this need I need to draw I need to draw what's around me I find it very grounding that's so amazing I I think that that need I think a lot of people listening right now will will understand that need inside them not only for nature but also for expression for that 
for putting something on paper, for that moment of creativity, groundedness. It's beautiful the way you talked about that. Right. And, you know, just to add to that, like when you're talking about putting something on the page, because you're so focused while you're drawing, right, and you've drawn it, when you come back and look at that, you'll remember that moment. It's like an imprint of your focus and calm in a moment in time. And then there's incredible gratitude that comes from that because you realize how privileged you were to be able to take, you know, an hour of your day, 15 minutes from your day and focus on the beauty of what you were drawing or thinking about. And that makes you very grateful because you realize not everyone has that opportunity. And you were able to make that time for yourself. And it's really, to me, this beautiful moment of self-care. We talk so much about self-care. This is a very simple way to connect to something and make something. I love that. You're, you're so right. And I haven't thought about that before, but just the act of having the time, just the privilege of having the time to do that right. is something to be grateful for. And I love that you focused on that because, yeah, that is a privilege. That is something that's, right? that's joyous, that is is special to take the time to do that. I from from watching you on Instagram and your your process I feel like you're a I feel like you're a learner a lifelong learner would you say that about yourself Oh absolutely I mean it's really interesting because if you go to my Instagram page it's kind of funny like if you go to the very beginning like if you went years back right all of a sudden you see all of these terrariums <laughs> and I went through this phase before I was like okay I need to draw again where my making was terrariums and it really went back to this childhood oh, love of damp the, because the that's damp. what a terrarium oh, wow. right? and it was the moss and it was putting you know these terrariums together and like my husband teases me because it was like <laughs> I was the speed terrarium maker like I would buy all of this glassware and all of the plants and the potting soil and I'd be on the kitchen table and in 20 minutes, I'd have like eight, 10. I'm like, oh, I'm done. And he's like, isn't the point of this to sit and relax and do it deliberately and like think about what you're doing? And then before I knew it, I had like 20 terrariums in my apartment in Brooklyn. And I was like, this is crazy. What did you I, do with them? I would put, and this is the sad part because there was no direct light. Like I was trying to figure out the best place. I had them on shelves sort of in the kitchen and they get, they catch a bit of light and you know, Sadly, a lot of them would die, like they mm -hmm. weren't surviving. Mm -hmm. And then it really became this like madness of like <laughs> they would die, these little plants, and then I'm rebuilding them. And then, you know, then it became I scaled it back, and then there were a few that survived, and I kept them there. And I realized I was more focused on creating little scenes in them with like little miniature plastic animals. Like it was as if I was creating these You're other making worlds. the worlds like, again. Mm. Yeah, and I was like, you know what? Why don't we just take this to paper? There is less, <laughs> <laughs> less death, <laughs> less death, um, and you know your moss bill won't be so high. Like it, it was, it was. I, I mean, I was going to the pet store to buy um, charcoal that they put in aquariums to put in these terrariums and just giant bags of charcoal and wood chips. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is. <laughs> but that's you know that's connecting to nature in a city. Like I yeah. can have this little terrarium in my apartment or many terrariums but um so yes I'm sorry I like veered off we were talking about the Instagram being, and a, so lear I being a learner learner right so mm -hmm. that was the learner I'm mm -hmm. learning about plants and what grows in certain environments and then we go from these like terrariums to starting to draw and you you sort of see that I'm fiddling with color and fiddling with drawing and then you know you if I look at my earlier work, some of it I actually, I have an appreciation for because it's so much looser mm. and I see yeah. I was a lot freer because I didn't have that expectation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I eventually got to a point where I wanted to take a certificate in botanical and illustration at New York Botanical Gardens. And that was great. And I, and, you know, I just started that like pre pandemic, but what that's done is it's made things very academic for mm -hmm. me. And actually, it sort of tied my hands in a way of this is a project from start to finish and you need to make beautiful pieces and there cannot be an error here. And and I part of me really misses that looseness, which I think comes from a more daily drawing, journaling, mm -hmm. sketchbook practice. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting 
I I think a lot about that about the freedom and the and the binds like of um, freedom of expression and also mm-hmm. that that feeling that comes when we when we want to make something perfect and how that changes inside us um, and there is something really satisfying about making something beautiful and exact and at the same time it's a different it's a different feeling in your stomach and in your heart when you're when you're making it isn't it it is it is and it, and I think sometimes like the like if I'm doing something it's like technical like recently I've been on this gourd colored pencil project and that was <laughs> that was difficult because you know you're looking at light on form in two ways like on the micro level of these little naughty bumps on this gourd and then the actual form and so you're figuring that out and you're color mixing with colored pencils and that process was very academic mm-hmm. and then it got to a point where I'd practice enough and like you get to like the third gourd and I'm coloring it in and literally it did feel like I was coloring it in mm-hmm. in the sense it was just very meditative small little strokes and it was building and at that point I was like you have freedom now because you're not so inside your head. And I think that's so important, you know, not to be focused on creating this perfect picture, which is why I think it's good to have a balance. For mm-hmm. me, the balance in finding like, let's, let's, let's be a little looser and let go is this hobby I've sort of discovered recently of going to museums and sketching the taxidermy, which is like mm-hmm. another fun way to connect to, to, to nature in a way. Um, and so that that's my way of saying, you're just going to sketch. And if it looks terrible, we move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. You're there to learn, you mm-hmm. know. Oh, so cool. So I want to ask you about, so you create under the name Garden Slug Productions. And yeah. I'm thinking now going back to those damp yeah. environments. Tell me about the name that you that you chose. Well, it was, it was kind of, it was really sort of a silly thing. Like I had just gotten this Instagram account. I just, I was building all of these terrariums. So like, I'm (laughs) always at these garden centers and stores. So gardens in my head. And I've, I, you know, and I mentioned it before, I just really like snails and slugs and, and the earthworms. And I think it is because they emerge out of the earth after the rain. And then, you know, they're like, they want to come out and say hello when they get like the beautiful drizzle of rain. And, and to me, (laughs) I don't know, I find them, there's something almost magical about that world underneath mm. the soil where the mushrooms grow and, it, and it's quiet and it's like all of nature's secrets are there. Mm. And so garden slug production, garden came from, you know, the terrariums and slug, just it's fun to say garden slug. And production, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of me being silly. It's like, this is, you know, this is my passion project. I produce things. Like, it just makes it everything yes. sound so grand. Like, <laughs> I'm a production company. Meanwhile, you know, I'm just building terrariums that are ultimately going to die. <laughs> and, and and sort of sketching these things. And, you know, with, with the whimsical little critters, that was also a little fun, you know, calling it Garden Slug Productions. Like, you're sort of producing these little animals doing very human things, like very inspired by Beatrix Potter. Like that's one thing that sort of moves me through my storyboards when I'm, you know, illustrating or drawing. So yeah, that's where it comes from. It was, it was just kind of something silly. And I I didn't realize that I would just stick to it. Like now more than ever, I'm like, it's perfect. It's Why would totally I? Totally perfect. <laughs> it makes me it's... smile every time I read it. Also because like slugs are something that people are a little like, some people are squeamish yeah. about or makes people feel uncomfortable and I just love that you're just embracing the mollusk embracing yes. the <laughs> slugs and snails and oh yeah well as you saw like slug timber which yes was... <laughs> tell me about <laughs> slug tell me about slug timber this made me smile so much you know what I have to because it really slug timber was the joy I did not realize I needed in my life so <laughs> What happened was in August, I went to a place called Snow Farmcraft in um, Williamsburg, Massachusetts. And it was essentially an art camp for adults, like art workshops. So there were four areas, like you could be a glass work, you know, oh, do glass works wow. or mosaics or ceramics. And there was one, I guess, module for botanical illustration. Wow. And a teacher that I have taken classes with before, and she's phenomenal 
Um, Wendy Hollander is her name. She does yes. beautiful, beautiful color pencil work. And she was teaching there. And I was like, I have to go. This is my vacation. And it was amazing. And the amazing thing was I was drawing from nature that I was finding and foraging. Mm. So there were these bolet mushrooms growing right outside my little dorm cottage. And I would scoop them up in hand and they were muddy. And I would just be drawing them while in hand. And that wow. was just this beautiful experience because living in the city, a lot of times the mushrooms I was drawing were coming from the farmer's market mm -hmm. or even the grocery store, you know, sort of during the pandemic where you can't really source things. But it was this moment of daily creation, right? I was drawing every day. And when I came back, I knew I had to continue that, but in a much more, you know, doable way, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't spend all day drawing. We all have jobs and other things we need to do. So I wanted to figure out a way to do daily drawing. And I'd done an Instagram, you know, challenge, the daily art challenge, which are always daunting. Like you want yes. to join them and you're like, can I do this? And there's so much pressure. But in May, I did one that was mushroom focused because I was like, I can handle this. I can handle mushrooms, a mushroom a day, and I'll work really small. And it was mushroom and it was fantastic. And it just made me so happy. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'll find a challenge. And I couldn't find something that spoke to me. And then I don't know what happened. Um, it was it was just there. Like I, I knew it had to be snails. And I think one thing that did um, trigger this is while I was at camp, I met this wonderful individual. Her name is Liliana and she does glass works, glass beads. And she would do little toadstools. And then we were talking and she was like, do you like snails? And it was this connection. I'm like, <laughs> how did I find myself in this place with people who are so like-minded? And I said, yes. And she showed me this snail that was absolutely breathtakingly beautiful, made from glass that she oh, had wow. done. And so snail was in my head. And I, and I actually purchased that piece from her because it was so beautiful and I, I wanted to give it a home. Like, and sort of that was a joke. I'm like, I can give it a really nice home. <laughs> and I'm staring at this and I'm thinking, I have to draw every day. And that's when I realized it has to be snails. And then I was like, I'm going to create this challenge. Yes. Maybe people will join. And so it was two days of internet research of all these different snails and slugs <laughs> and learning, you know, about them. And this process of like, well, what colors have I chosen? Because I had to be very particular. I wanted a good diversity like mm. I can only have five yellow ones and I need some brown ones and and then I, I didn't even realize that there's something called a candy cane snail from like the Caribbean or the Cuban painted snails they're unreal that I saw your colors... work of that. oh my gosh it looks it looks like like something you would make up from your Imagine, mind if you were right. creating a magical world right right and so I so I created this list and I became so silly with it. It was like, you know, the list to drop in one week, everyone get ready. And I'm like, who are you talking to? No one is going to draw snails. And you know, ultimately, it, there were about four or five people who drew along. And one person in particular, um, I believe, I think his last name is Griefson, it's B. Griefson. Mm -hmm. And he's from the UK. And he, on Instagram, I think he is a comic book illustrator, artist, graphic novel um, that's his world. And he mm -hmm. joined and he actually did one for every day and cool. they were phenomenal. <laughs> so they blew me away. And that was amazing in the sense that here I was doing something, you know, for me thinking this is going to be fun for me, but then, you know, giving someone a prompt and then taking that and having them being inspired by that yes. and helping someone else create and giving them that project, I can't tell you the joy. It was like this effect of, oh my goodness, you're interested in doing this. And it was so humbling to know that your words or what you were creating was causing someone else to engage in a creative process. And it was only one connection, but that's all I needed. It didn't yes. need to be hundreds of people drawing snails. It was a handful of people, you know, five people just, you know, drawing when they could. And it was just an amazing experience. There is something so powerful about meeting someone who is on the same page 
loves what you love and even if it's something very specific like snails or slugs Mm -hmm. and then to meet that person and to say you love snails too like there's something um so precious in that exchange and that the internet and technology has allowed us to connect with those people wherever they be in the world is is such a special thing I'm so glad you have that you had that experience. Yeah, and and, you know, it's so great you said that because yes, there is a downside to social media, right? Mm. There is so much out there that can be problematic, you know, and the sort of vanity with having this account Mm. and who's following me and who's liking it and is my work good enough to post Mm. it? You could get in this spiral of neurotic thinking and it's terrible. (laughs) It's just so terrible to to be sitting there and thinking that way, but then you can make connection Mm. and especially during the pandemic where yes. you couldn't see people or talk to people or meet new people. I, I for some reason, I thrived through meeting people mm-hmm. during this time through like art connections or nature connections and learning that there were like-minded people. I didn't know like nature journaling was a thing or that mm-hmm. I, I attended my first wild um, nature journaling conference and I took your class. Like, yes. that, um <laughs> Your sky class, which was amazing, the sky scapados, like that was brilliant. Tell me about your experience with the Wild Wonder Conference, because that's so precious to to be able to connect with people all over the world, learn from people wherever they are. Right. Tell me about your Wild Wonder experience. It, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I learned about it. You know, it was because Wendy Hollander had yes. posted that she was going to be doing a session. So I was like, what is this conference? And then my jaw dropped. And I actually remember (laughs) being in the car with my husband and I'm looking at this and I'm going through the names of the classes, like, you know, birds and gouache. And uh, there were so many fantastic classes or like drawing on toned paper, like things that I'm into or how to make an insect shiny, right? And then all of the educational lectures that came with it. Yes. And so I'm seeing this and I'm like, okay, I'm going to sign up. And I had no idea what space I was walking into until I logged on. And then when I realized, you know, what was happening, I was like, there are so many people who find beauty in the same things you do and care about the same things you do and want to share their knowledge. And my heart just, it expanded in a way that I, it's indescribable. Like I was so happy and overwhelmed with joy and it was really this emotional experience of understanding you're not alone yes like your hobbies aren't weird like (laughs) wanting to draw snails every day isn't weird I bet there are tons of people if you put up a picture of the snail they'll draw it with you yes and you'll be amazed at what you see what other people do with it and you know um one thing that I really liked about that conference I think uh Mark uh Simmons Mm -hmm. was doing a sort of cartooning, how do I frame, you know, a comic and sort of from a nature journaling, journaling perspective. And he did that um, workshop. And I remember sitting there and I'm looking and I'm like, there's a shelf of little plastic animal toys behind him. And I'm like, and if you notice, yes. I have that <laughs> shelf because earlier this year I took through the botanical garden. It was this great class. It was a uh, drawing mammals. And the instructor was fantastic. And she brought up um, one thing you can use for reference material are these figurines because you can sort of move them around and imagine how their, you know, their bodies go and it will help you with gait and will add more life to your drawing other than looking like a photo. So, you know, clearly I'm not going to have this beautiful fox um, (laughs) sitting nicely and quietly for me to draw. You know, maybe if if I'm lucky enough to ever see one, it's just going to run by quickly. Same with rabbits. And so I asked him, I asked him, I'm like, um, you know, through the chat, what are those models there for? And he basically said, I need to be around it to know how to draw it. Like I figured that's how I'm going to learn how to draw it. And that's exactly why I have these models and that connection that someone else values it and feels the same way about Mm. something as you do. It's just, again, it, it takes away from this loneliness we can often feel. Yes. Because I find now in this time, like it's just so easy to feel lonely. Even if you do have close family around, like I'm saying during lockdown, you know, you might have been fortunate to have your family close Mm. by or have, you know, someone you were living with. But even just now as things start to open up, 
there there still remains you know for some people this loneliness and i think we we always have to work with that and like how do you connect to something so you don't feel alone like how do you get solitude but contentment right because there's nothing wrong with being alone but it's when you're missing a connection and that's that's what the nature journaling conference did for me it it filled a void it gave mm-hmm. me connection and it inspired me it was like your work matters someone cares about it yes and also other people love the same things like there's other mm-hmm. people doing what you're doing and loving what you love and that's so cool i'm interested um you said that the pandemic made you really focus on nature in particular and about drawing. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear a little more about your experience, how the COVID pandemic was f- for you mm-hmm. from the beginning and how that's driven your art practice. Sure. Uh, you know, it was. it's really interesting because pre-pandemic, like right before we all realized that, because no one realized we're going to yeah. be in lockdown and it's going to be this long, you know, and no one could fathom that could happen to the world, to the world, like not just your own country, the yes. whole world. And I actually was in the middle of art classes. And I, I distinctly remember it was like two or two more classes of colored pencil to go. And then it was like, no, classes canceled. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll try to do, you know, the Zoom. We'll, we'll try to do this online. It, no one was even using the word Zoom. It's like, yes. we'll see what there is, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so... With that, you know, we're all sort of in our houses, in our space. And like for us, you know, the only sort of escape or activity we had would would be to get that walk, to walk outside. Mm -hmm. And I would be outside. And then being in like a city environment, walking around the same block every day, Mm -hmm. it it actually got to the point of, oh, my gosh, this is so – it just felt you're running the same story Mm -hmm. every day. And – you know, you're seeing trees that, that may be around you and there are the parks, but I needed more. I needed to go into nature. So at that point, very fortunate, um, my husband and I went up to the Catskills several times just to Airbnbs and spaces just to, to be away. And this was in the middle of winter um, also. Like, at the, you know, it was, well, not really in the middle of winter. That was kind of towards the end of last mm-hmm. year. But it started off in the spring and we would go away and we would just take hikes, beautiful hikes in the Catskills Mountains of upstate New York. And it was just a really transformative time for me because I didn't realize how much I needed nature. I didn't Mm -hmm. realize what a calming effect it could potentially have because it took me away from like that day-to-day hamster wheel, like running around and around and around. And you're not really getting anywhere. You're just sort of like the next day becomes the next. And it's just, you ask yourself, what's the purpose of everything? And when you're in nature, there is something bigger than you. And no matter what's happening in the world or what circumstances there are, that nature persists. And it knows how to grow. And that was my moment of you need to learn in this space and you need to be connected in this space. And the moment you lose your footing from this space, you'll lose your calm you'll lose that peace, which we all sort of need to find meaning in our day and that underlying joy we all want to have. And so for me, it was the nature and that was that connection. Now, the one thing the pandemic did was it brought together this sort of Zoom community and classes. And I say that, classes. So many classes that would have been unavailable to me because I don't live in an area. I that now have access to. So there were art teachers in California, there are art teachers in the UK, and they have classes available. And it doesn't matter where you are, you can sign up for them. And that was amazing to me. That's the one thing I hope remains is that, you know, this this online learning and these groups and these meetings we can have. Like you're in Australia, it's morning for you. And yes. I'm here and we connected over Instagram. And we're having this amazing conversation right now. And I don't know if that would have happened if there hadn't been this need for us to all connect online. You know, I think you would have you would have had your podcast and definitely, you know, have different guests. But would I have been so out there and like at nature journaling, which is, yeah. you know, that conference which was opened up 
online this year, would, would that have happened? And I think that that's been this benefit for me, has been to be able to connect to so many people in so many different places. So that's really what happened during the pandemic. So there was also this time. Also, I had more time. I had more time to sit at my desk and be like, yes. I'm going to draw. And I would just get lost. And, and I, it, it, to me, getting lost in your work, like that, that's when there's success there. It's like, not what it looks like, but you're lost in it. Yes. You've almost become it. Like what you're creating, you know, is, it's magic to me. Putting pen to paper is truly magic. Like that's what I believe. That's, that's why I love it. I love what you just said. I, I, feel, I felt the same during the pandemic that nature was the, the solid thing. Nature was the consistent thing in a world mm-hmm. that felt completely crazy. Nature was always yes. there doing the same thing. Oh, I love the word consistent, right? Mm-hmm. And we wanted consistent because we were yeah. thrown out of our routine. There was no certainty. And, it, and in a way, there still isn't. Like there was so much yes. hesitation still course it's still there and certainty within nature because if it's consistent there's some certainty there Mm -hmm. and you're so right about the this new world that we have where we can connect with teachers and friends and colleagues across the world that is something that I don't think would have evolved in the same way hadn't it been born out of this necessity to connect to absolutely to keep active i i love that i'm really grateful for that it is quite astonishing it, it is and it you know i'm actually quite shy and introverted so and you know it's funny because if you ask people and oh my god no she's not she's always talking and she's <laughs> loud and she's laughing but no like really my true nature mm. is to be quiet and alone so having the ability to connect sort of online connection is very much on your terms, right? I can just end, like if I dip leave the meeting, yeah. dip, you know, no one's going to be like, where did she go? Or, you know, <laughs> I don't have to leave my house. I can be in my pajamas. Like, you know, it's, if I need to go to bed, I can do that. Like if yeah. I need to, oh, this talk is getting a bit boring. I'll go downstairs, get a coffee and run back. Right. Like there's all of these things you can do, but yeah. I, I really find I've been enjoying that piece of it mm. because there is, there is something very, connecting even though it's an online presence I mean yes of course being in person is a wonderful thing I love that very much but this has been this has been nice and and I think you've learned so much because you're meeting so many different people yeah absolutely I feel like I'm getting to know the birds of North America just by <laughs> through the through the journal pages of other people <laughs> yeah I mean I, I learned about this. Please help me on this. It's an Australian mammal. It looks mm-hmm. like, I would say it looks like a groundhog. It's called, a, begins with a, a cor, cor, corcus, um, no. Um, a quokka? Yes. Yes, a quokka. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I can't recall where, but I, I read some article and I'm yeah. like, why am I getting into this? Why is this my suggested content, this little cute quokka? And then <laughs> yeah. I was like, Oh, it's because you're following all of these like nature people from around yeah. the world. And I'm like, and I'm looking, I'm like, yes. and then I'm wondering, I have all these questions. I'm like, is it a pest? And, you know, does it dig up holes in people's gardens? Or are they, you know? Quokkas are amazing. I have never seen one. They're, oh, okay. they're in um, Western Australia. Okay. But they, the funny thing about them is that they have this permanent smile. I don't know if you saw that, but if you yes. take a photo of a quokka, it looks like it's got this huge yes. smile. Which is why I think it was almost a meme. They were m- making fun of the quokka, like, if this doesn't make you happy, <laughs> what will? And I'm like, is this, this looks like a cartoon almost. Yeah. And so I, I had to ask you about this mammal. I'm like, hmm. Bethan might know. <laughs> I love that. I love that you know about quokkas. That's see, that's that's and that's it. Even, and I love that you now I know how to pronounce it because I'm like, I pronounce <laughs> this. <laughs> that is so fun. So I want to ask you. One day you mentioned to me that art supply stores are your happy place, and yes. I want you to describe for me your favorite art supply store in New York City. Without hesitation, it is Blick Art Stores. Okay, tell me what happens when you go in there. What do you see? What's it like? What can you buy? So I have to be, you know, the thing about Blick is it is a superstore of art supplies. And they have great prices on things that, like, you have the list price and they have 
because I, I don't know if it's because of volume or how, I don't know how they do it, but you can get very, you know, expensive professional supplies at, at a reasonable price. It's, you know, mm-hmm. and it's amazing. And it's just, they have an aisle just for colored pencil. They have an aisle just for watercolor, you know, an aisle just of brushes, just for markers and everything you want and every possible brand. Like, <laughs> And I remember when you did your presentation, you were talking about your travel palette and you were, it was a, a Daniel Smith, right? That's mm-hmm. the right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So Daniel Smith watercolor. And you were talking about the Jane's Gray. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and I love it because it's like Payne's Gray or yep. Jane's Gray. It's amazing. <laughs> and I, they have that palette there available. Yes. And I was so excited to get that travel palette. But yeah, so there's a section for every color possible within every range. And the thing is, I will come out of there with things I just don't need or things I want to try. Oh, gosh. I do the same. <laughs> like, it's like you don't need metallic colored pencils what are you going to be drawing and I'm like iridescence and I'm like and then in my head that would be cheating there's ways of making something shiny you know without having like the iridescent colored pencils but I get so excited because yes. to me it's these supplies are going to make something wonderful yes and the thought that there are people who come in there and can do brilliant things with these supplies is amazing to me. And it's a community in there because everyone's doing something. And the, the, the blip I like to go to is around some local art schools. So, you know, you see these like young students and you're like, where are you going with this? Like, yes. you're going to make something wonderful. The potential, yeah. the potential, right? It's this potential. And it's just nice to see people from all different, you know, walks of life in one place. I mean, that's New York City to begin with. Mm-mm. But then when you're in, like, it's the same sampling of what is outside is in the store, and they're all very focused. And I can only imagine the diversity of what you're going to be producing. But, that is so fun. You know, and that and that's why I really love going in there. And then I always have a need to buy, well, I'm always out of one colored pencil. Like, it's always, you know, the highlighting color, like the ivory in the Faber-Castell <laughs> set. Um <laughs> but it's just, and I like the smell of colored pencils. Oh, so it just yes. Sounds like And paper. Swap. I love the oh. smell of paper. I know. <laughs> it's like almost like the touch, like the touch of the paper. Yeah. But like, yeah, that colored pencil smell. It's, it's, to me, it's, if we could put it in a perfume bottle, I would just be, you know, that and then moss. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those would be my pencil signature moss. stuff. Ooh, yeah. You're onto something. You should start a line for artists, perfume yeah. for artists. Perfect. Yeah, it would be Garden Slug's first production. And it would be <laughs> yes. like the, the sample bottles of little sets. It's like, this is colored pencil. This is eraser. Yes. This is paper. This is a brand new journal. Yes. I'm, I'm there. I'm buying yeah. it. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny, like with art supplies, I have bought so many sketchbooks, but my my confession is because I am have so much anxiety about just drawing something quickly and going to the next page, they just, they don't really get started. Like I'll rather work by taking a piece of paper out of like a watercolor block and putting it on a board and drawing and be like, I'm journaling. It's just not a part of a book because I can yes. throw this away if it's embarrassing. And that, that's a terrible way to think. But I, I mean, I'm just being very honest. Like my, this concept of journaling is it's difficult for me mm-hmm. because it's this need to be perfect. And I, I was wondering, like, what do you do to sort of get out of that space and just be like, it's a journal and I'm going to capture the day? Well, I have had the same thing as you where I'll start a journal and I'll do something that I'm really happy with on the first or second page yeah. and then I don't want yeah. to mess it up. So I just put that to the side and then do something else and it's not very functional. Like, I, And I actively try to scribble in my journals, but it, it does like take some training because... I have the same feeling like you want to make something pretty you want to make something that right. you can show people and be proud of but that is not for me the the main goal the main goal is to connect with nature right um get into that flow that you were talking about where you're just one you're you're in that moment with right. with your paper and your art supplies and and your subject and so it is actually an ongoing thing and I do have 
lots of journals with one or two things in the front pages but Mm -hmm. I'm really actively training myself just to just to scribble just to do quick sketches right let go of let go of that but it is a process it is an active process I understand you (laughs) yeah no I just sort of pause and it's like you know you always know your own bad habits right like Mm -hmm. you're so aware of what you're doing and you're like that's bad don't do that like just you know (laughs) work through this. This isn't, you know, a healthy relationship to have with the journal. This is supposed to be for fun and connection. I think one thing is um, not buying too good quality art supplies. I think when I get yes. really good quality journals, then I want to do something high quality in them. And if right. I buy a less, a cheaper or a less quality product, then I, I'm okay about scribbling. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It, it's, and even if you are scribbling with a nice pencil, it's just scribble, enjoy. Like if you don't, yeah. if you don't use that pencil or that, you know, paint, what's it going to do for you? Like I have this beautiful tube of Daniel Smith lavender, right? It was like, it was almost like, it, it's like this exotic chocolate for me. It's yes, like, oh, it's like confectionery, isn't it? It's it like... is. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to waste the paint. Just squeeze very, oh, we're not going to pull out that color. And I'm like, no, we love it. Yes. And and you have to enjoy it. Like my favorite color, I you know, and I learned this color through taking your workshop was when you were going through that little palette is the quinacridone. Ah, I can never say that quinacridone gold. Yes. And that was for me, I mean, it's like when you put that on white paper. Yes. It shines, it's like, right? It, it's, it's magic. It just <laughs> adds this. It's almost as if, like, you could say, well, it's in the family of burnt sienna, like a lighter golden burnt sienna. Like, you took burnt sienna and maybe added mm-hmm. some, you know, cad yellow that you might get there. But there is there is this beautiful, beautiful pigment there. I'm just in love with all of his colors. It's, you know. <laughs> uh, color is something I'm totally passionate about. And I love talking with my guests about color. And it's mm-hmm. just like that same feeling when you meet someone who loves snails or whatever. For me, it's like yes, we can talk about different mm-hmm. pigments and it's just, right. it's that same feeling like, yes, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I want to talk to you because I've noticed that and I'm noticing it right now that in every every photograph I see of you, it, you have a little piece of nature reflected in the clothes that you wear. Oh. <laughs> You might have mushrooms on your socks right. or a hedgehog on and your yeah. dress. Right, right now I can see mushrooms. Mush- oh, this is new. I was very excited. I love it, got, it. <laughs> it got. See, this is also my addiction: is clothes <laughs> with nature prints on them. I'm very specific, and it blows my mind sometimes. I'm like, who else would want mushrooms on their dress or hedgehogs <laughs> or a snail? But it's there. There, there are people out there who enjoy the same type of thing and want to wear them. So yes, I, for, there are a few brands out there that really actually have this connection to nature. And oh, wow. one thing I have to tell you about is I actually, the, the quokka, what is, what is that quokka. mammal's quokka, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there is this brand that's Australian called um, Princess Highway. Okay. And they are very connected in nature prints on their clothing. And they actually have a quokka print um, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm gonna cool. have to. I'll have to send you onto Instagram and show you because that also fueled this interest in this yeah. cute little mammal. But anyway, <laughs> so there are all of these brands out there. I've noticed that you know really do have this nature connection, and they mm-hmm. also produce clothes with like sustainable fabrics. And so it's sort of an interesting sort of mix of like fashion and these like mushrooms and snails and foxes and and it's just a lot of fun it's a lot of fun for me I like to wear I like to wear what's in my heart right and so if drawing these things gives me such joy wearing them certainly does and like even in my little art studio I have here I'm just going to shift this like so just so you see behind me oh wow I, yeah I love to collect natural history prints those are mm-hmm. actually all um encyclopedia pages from you know, encyclopedias from the 1800s, like um, uh, Richard Lydecker's Natural History. Oh, wow. Beautiful. And, you know, I'm just surrounding myself, right? Like, yes. If I can't get into the woods, I'm going to wear it and I'm going to put it up around me. 
but yes, yeah, so clothing is it's sort of that. a really expressive way for me to, when I'm not drawing, show, look, I like, I like nature. I'm, I'm wearing nature. Yeah. Does it spark conversations with other people? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, today I was, um, you know, I'd mentioned to you earlier when we were talking that I had gone to the cinema and before that, just gone into, or actually after the movie, I went to go get a coffee and, you know, the barista just looked at me and was like, I love your dress. And I was yes. like, thank you. <laughs> and then it, it went into, have you seen the Netflix documentary on the mushrooms? It's amazing. I just watched it last night. And, and it, and like the conversations start going and it's, it's great. It becomes a conversation starter. Yes. And how like, wonderful. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's fun. It's a way to be playful mm. in a very serious world. That's <laughs> the way I look at it. I love that so much. Yeah, being playful, maintaining that that sense of play is so important for maintaining mental health and for maintaining just joy in life, I think. And we can ha sometimes have a tendency to become se very serious. Right. And I think I, I'm I'm with you. I think play is so important. It's it's so important, and I and I think when you lose that sense of needing to play and explore you know, what, what's the purpose then, right? Yeah. What, what are, isn't life supposed to be playful, right? Isn't that what we work so hard for, you know? Once, yes. you know, we have our immediate needs taken care of and you have this time, if you're not playing in that time, and to me, learning is playing because yes. if you're learning something new, you're going to experiment and that experimentation is going to be play. It's like a great thing. And if you don't do that, I think you just just become numb and you just yeah. sort of you're not engaging and that's sad to me because that's that's not you know a way to live right life is supposed to be vibrant and yeah. I think if you forget to play you're missing out and you your clothes your clothes <laughs> bring so, your clothes bring a little spark of joy I yeah. think in into the day whenever I see a picture of you with a <laughs> mushroom or a hedgehog on on your it's, dress it just makes me feel happy yeah thank you and, I, and you know it means a lot that you say that like I always get such joy like I you know you feel like you're wearing a little bit of a costume during the day you're like oh yes I'm an adult woman and I'm, I have a dress with a hedgehog on it. Like, and then of course it's just joy. Like I, I joke around yeah. a lot with my sister because I'm like, can you believe this sweater exists? I need it. And she's like, do you, do you really? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fun. It's another way to be playful. I love that. It, Preeti, it has been such a joy to talk with you. I can't stop smiling. I feel joy in my heart oh, and I'm so, so nice. <laughs> I'm so glad to connect with you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Preeti. I really enjoyed hearing about her commitment to learning new skills and how learning is synonymous with play. Do you feel that? I feel it 100%. Recently, I started a beginner course in Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language. Learning Auslan is something that I've wanted to do for years, and it feels so wonderful to be learning this language and very much like play. The classes that I'm taking are on Zoom, and the teacher is constantly smiling, and all the students are smiling and laughing. It feels so good to stretch the brain and to make silly mistakes, and laugh at ourselves. Preeti touched on how it's quite easy to get stuck on the desire for perfection in our artwork and how this can sometimes be something that holds us back. It's the same with language learning. We, we might be embarrassed to make mistakes or be self-conscious to begin speaking, but we need to let go of this if we want to progress. Languages, a new art skill, or whatever we're learning, we have to also be learning to let go of this self-consciousness or self-criticism, to bring the joy and freedom back into the process, bring the play back into our lives. I'd love to know what feels like play for you. You can leave a comment describing your own forms of play in the comment section below this episode on the podcast page on my website. A link to this page will be in the show notes. Also in the show notes is a link to Preeti's Instagram page where you can find her beautiful artwork 
as well as some photos of her wearing the nature-inspired outfits that we talked about. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.